Hi everybody, how are you doing? I'm it's after seven and I'm just on my way for a little walk. It's kind of nippy out there, so I have my jacket. And um, later on, I have to stop off at the drugstore for something. And um, I, I just wanted to remind you that uh, tonight we're continuing our discussion of the case of the disappearance of 15-year-old Melanie Edier, whose birthday falls right on Christmas Day. And so she disappeared, she vanished actually into thin air with no clues or evidence left behind whatsoever in 1996. So um, we're going to be continuing with that tonight. And um, other than taking you along on a walk with me, I haven't really done too much today uh, other than taking care of some things around the house. Um, on the agenda for the household, I need to pick up some paint at one point or another for my laundry room because it's, it, guys, uh, it's been six years that I've been planning that project. Even when my mom was alive, um, she would tell me, ask me, when are you going to do it? When are you going to paint? Um, I don't know. It's um, a very tight and narrow room, and so I'm not looking forward to it. I have to share my space with the litter box. Um, but it has to be done because it's a mess. It's a total ravaged mess. And uh, somebody came in in 2019, right after my mom passed away in, in the winter time, and drilled holes all over the wall. Oh, wow, I guess that person skipped their medication that day. What can I say? But anyway, um, I really do need to cover it, um, actually with paper, and then maybe paint it, because I, I cannot afford all that wallpaper for um, a dinky little <laughs> laundry room, you know, wall. I, I'm thinking of maybe picking up some parcel paper or something like that and we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, with parcel paper, you can paint over it whatever you want, and um, I can make my own designs on it. I can get creative, and if I don't like it, I'll just tear it down. I like doing stuff like that. Crazy, huh? So here I am again. I'm still on my way to my walk. I wanted to take a couple of minutes. I hope it's only going to stay at a couple of minutes to address more hate um, aimed at, I don't know if it's aimed only at me, but it now seems that other channels are being targeted as well. Um, from what I can understand, the um, hater uh, and I'm, I'm assuming there are multiple haters out there, okay? There's a lot of um, hate for my content. So um, what I want to say is this. Uh, I spent, today is Wednesday. I spent the better, um, I wouldn't say a better half, almost an entire two days of Sunday and Monday, responding and commenting to all of your videos and comments on my channel. Okay, the ones on my channel, some of them got deleted. I don't know how. Where'd they go? I know there's a lovely channel out there. The owner's name is Anne. Anne, I'm sorry, I saw your comment. 
but it popped away before I could even respond to it. And I have to apologize. I've been taking an awful long time to respond because I, you know, I was busy with the recipe and then all those comments, which I love. It took me a while. It took me a while. Um, a lot of them were gone. And so um, I, I take this to mean that either you got fed up waiting for me to respond or the hacker, again, struck. And YouTube knows who this person is, but I think there are more than one. And all those channels that suddenly disappeared and became other channels. I, am f I unsubscribe because I don't know that channel and I don't, you know, um, they may be great and amazing channels, but no, you know, I, I don't know who that channel belongs to. So I guess it's bye for now. Um, anyway, oh, I list 40 videos that I watched. And I know I watched more than that. All of the comments disappeared, my comments. Now, there are four men who are always present in those comments, maybe five men, are not all together. Every time my comment disappears, those YouTubers are there. And who are they attacking when they hack into your accounts to delete my comment? They're not doing it from my channel, too. They're doing it from yours. Um, they're attacking all the wonderful cooking channels and all the creative channels. Up by Ropui is a wonderful channel who's been victimized, victimized like I have, by this hacker. This hacker leaves wonderful comments and hates. Okay. But he ain't coming back to my channel. That's probably why it's happening. And um, why it's happening with you guys is because I subscribe to you. So I'm sorry that it's happening, but the hate is, is spreading to your channels. I'm sorry. For those of you who repeatedly deleted my comments, I unsubscribed. Bye. Bye. I have a way of knowing. Um, actually, it's not my way. It's the detective's way of exactly who is doing this and exactly who is getting hacked. So I know, essentially. I don't know who all the hackers are, but they've made it very clear. And so I put them all in a folder and I'm avoiding them like the plague because I don't want anything to happen to my computer. I also know that security downstairs, many of whom are horrid pedophiles in the past, um, they're constantly um, following me, stalking me. This goes on. It's been going on for 30 years, guys. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, it's implicit that they're there too, doing it. But now YouTube has taken to, um, wow, I've been talking for five minutes and 30 seconds. I'm sorry. YouTube, somebody, I don't know what country, I don't know who, has been um, promoting these ha um, hackers, this one particular hacker, and um, been trying to prevent me, stop me from processing my videos. Why? I have unlimited data at the highest speed possible. Why are you doing it, YouTube? Stop it! And so I, I guess I don't have to remind you again that the prevention of online communication or telephone communication or mail 
postal mail communication is against the law in every country in the world and is considered by governments to be illegal. Me mad? No, I'm not mad. I'm not angry. To the discussion of um, Melanie Evia, and I, I hope that you're ready to hear a little bit more about this case because it will be dragging on, and I'm not sure exactly how to approach all these different parts to it. But I, I it is a very high-profile case. Um, I mean, it's it's a cold case, and I consider all cold cases to be high profile. But this one has a, a few um, disturbing or puzzling, rather, facts that come with it. And so bear with me, and I'll try to get it, the last little bit uh, of this part out to you. And so hold on. So, um... In 2004, the area in which um, Melanie just vanished, um, New Liskeard, was um, transformed into the city of um, Temiskaming Shores. Uh, Temiskaming Shores um, joined with the neighborhood communities of Halebury, Diamond, and North Cobalt. So the OPP therefore took over law enforcement in that community in 2007. So it took a few years for the OPP to claim that territory uh, officially. And I don't know if that hurt the case. Um, I, I, I can't tell if um, there were any, you know, um, how do I say this? I, I can't, I, I cannot, um, I cannot tell if the uh, police investigation was not um, adequate. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't know if it was inefficient. I have no information on that. So um, the uh, constable later, uh, a constable later admitted that some tips issued to new rescued police um, about the case may not have been passed on during that transfer of um, region. The police that was transferring from New Liskeard, um to the new city of Temiskaming Temis Shores. So um, yeah, that that is exactly what I'm trying to get at here. I, I don't know if they just, if it was, um, if some of it was not neglected to be reported. I don't know. So um, let's focus on those years then, um, after 1996, regarding the disappearance of Melanie Evia. So um, in 2010, 
uh, a witness account of Eddie of Melanie crossing the Armstrong Street Bridge itself was made public. Now this was reported. Um, I, I don't know if it was reported in 2008, and I don't know what it, how old this sighting is, uh, this report actually of that sighting was, but um, uh, you know uh, it was made public in 2010, and even more details of that sighting were released in 20. 21 during the lockdown and I'm going to try to relate those to you right now uh, uh, to me it does sound a little weird but um, weird things are, are naturally going to sound weird right if you witness something weird it's going to sound weird <laughs> when you tell it to somebody else so you know I'm not knocking anything or criticizing anything here so um, according to two witnesses um Another couple, like we had with John and Eric, they were in a car driving across the bridge just at that time. And, you know, it's kind of creepy to think about it because I, I don't know whether to imagine Melanie isolated or on a busy bridge. I have no inkling of what she encountered that night. Um, if it was busy, it wouldn't have been that dangerous for her to cross the bridge on foot. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it was desolate and, and remote and isolated without people on it. Yeah, it would have been dangerous. So, um, okay, so she and her husband are in the car driving across the bridge and they both saw a teenaged black girl. Okay, so... Are they sure it was Melanie? Because if Melanie was supposed to have been abducted, this is going with a, one of my theories. If she were to have been abducted, they surely would have planted black girls, and I'm not trying to be rude here, girls that resembled Melanie walking along the bridge to give her a false timeline, right? Are you following where I'm going with this? So we don't know, A, if this couple was actually telling the truth. I have a feeling they were. I don't know if I should, you know, have any reason to doubt what they said. And number two, um, you know, it was, it was, um, we don't know if she actually went missing there or at the house on uh, Pine Street. So, or Pine Avenue. Anyway, so um, they described the night. Um, first of all, she was walking south on the eastern sidewalk. So um, the night was very clear and they saw no vehicles or pedestrians on the bridge. So um, there's the, que the answer to my question. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to know if the bridge was packed or crowded. So it would have stuck out like a sore thumb, this dark-skinned girl walking across the bridge at 1 a.m. in the morning, or probably after that. And so at the time of this sighting, the girl was closer to the north end of the bridge. Now, I don't know. I, I guess I have to look at the map, but I, I don't know if I'll be able to figure it out. I don't know if... Um, Ryan's house was closer to the north or closer to the east. So I don't know how long she had been walking. In other words, you get where I'm going with this question, right? So um, no other pedestrians were on the bridge. Uh, why, why is that? Um, does not surprise me at all. Um, at the time of the sighting, she was at the north end of the bridge, towards the north end of the bridge, and a witness commented that this girl indeed seemed too young to be out alone at night. And she was, guys. She was. Um, I don't know if this was a common occurrence for her. It could not have been. I, I, I think something happened with her boyfriend, Neil. I really do. Um, maybe they argued and she refused his company. I don't know. I don't know. So, um, 
she was walking, you know, calmly at an unperturbed pace, very normally. And um, her husband, the, the witness's husband, also remarked that he was not, this is where I, you know, draw the line. He was not aware that there were any black girls and you listed. How can that be, you know? First of all, how can there be no people of that race in a given region? It sounds stupid to me. But people actually do talk like this sometimes when they're amongst each other. Uh, I don't think they meant anything by that. And so um, although the witness, the wife, believed the girl's hair may have been in dreadlocks, it is possible that she might have misidentified braided extensions for dreadlocks, which basically that is what dreadlocks are, braided extensions. So obviously this woman doesn't is not that familiar with dreadlocks. Most dreadlocks are, in fact, um, extensions, right? Um, even you YouTubers out there who have had their hair and dreadlocks, you must know by now that they are braided extensions. So, um, anyway, the, the woman couldn't tell if it was her own hair, if it was Melanie's own hair, or the girl's own hair, or what? You know what I'm saying? She didn't get out of the car and get a good look. <laughs> anyway, um... They did not I, I report their account to police until 1997 or 8, when they finally saw Melanie's photo. Now, guys, um, would this mean that the OPP and the police who were working jointly did a crap job? Or were they lying? Were these witnesses lying? I mean, if a girl went missing in my area and I saw somebody who looked just like her and never bothered to tell anybody until 20 years later or three years later, whatever, that would make me out to be a liar, right? I, you don't do that. Um, the police did request a cooperation from the public and they didn't do it. Unless, of course, they were abroad for two years. I don't know what to think. This is the weird part, guys. This is the weird part. And so um, the tip, in any case, was never logged in to police records. Unless, it, of course, it was never reported. Are you following where I'm going with this? Can we really take these two eyewitness uh, accounts these two witness accounts, okay, the account of these two witnesses, uh, seriously? Is it real? Oh, we didn't call it in until 1997 or 1998, and it was never reported. This is BS. Whether the, it was the police who did it or the witnesses who did it, I don't know. But all the same, that's pure BS. You don't treat a sighting that important like a pile of crap. I, it may be that there was racial um, bias by the witness and they didn't think it was worth it because she was black. Nobody thinks like that anymore, or at least I hope not. Anyway, she was only 15, guys. And so um, the tip was therefore not logged either properly or ever because it was never reported. Maybe it was and it wasn't logged in. Who knows? So um, the witness uh, approached um, Melanie's mother, Celine, directly, at which point police were urged by Celine to revisit the sighting location. And police said they were not made aware of this witness account until 2008. And it wasn't until 2010 that um, it was made public. 
So the other details were made public in 2021, you know, about the dreadlocks and whatever. So, um, guys, it, it's up to you. Uh, nobody knows exactly what transpired. Um, we don't know if that was a fake sighting put there to kill the timeline or whether it really happened and it was never reported properly. I don't know. You know, I don't like cases like this. I don't like cases like this. Okay. So, in 2008, this is beginning to sound a little like the Maddie McCann case. 2009, another witness came forward to state that they saw Melanie on the Armstrong Street Bridge that night. And according, but you know, they just told us that there was nobody there. Melanie didn't spend a half an hour an entire night walking up and down the bridge. So are you getting where I'm going with this? No pedestrians, no drivers, but two witnesses. Mm. Mm -mm. No, guys. One of these is false, for sure, and maybe even both of them. I'm not sure. So um, she was there, and according to the witness, um, um, the witness's friends had been at the King George Tavern, located two blocks from the south end of the bridge until around 1 a.m. when they picked up food and coffee at a nearby restaurant. And um, as they were being driven across the bridge uh, home to their home by a friend, the witness spotted the girl near the midway point of the bridge around 145, 150. How long does it take to get across that little bridge? Wow. These accounts totally contradict each other. Again, the exact repeat of what we see in the Madeleine McCann case. And so um, from the back seat of this witness's ride, the witness saw the girl walking on the bridge's western sidewalk when a car pulled over and two young men exited the vehicle. Oh, the boys then proceeded to corner the girl and coerce her into entering their vehicle before they sped off. Oh, and they never called the police. They let 10 years, okay now, 1996 to 2008. They let 12 years go by. I would never believe a witness like that. And if I if I found proof that that were the case, I would have had him arrested. Anyway, um, so the boys um, took off. It was um, a small blue or light colored sedan, but they could not remember what the girl looked like. Hmm. If the other sighting was strange, this is by far the strangest. Um, I, I, I'm totally disappointed that they didn't call the police in 1996. What's wrong with people? To me, it sounds like a human trafficking ring, guys. And to me, it sounds like at least one of these witnesses were part of it. It sounds like. I'm not saying it is, but that's what you encounter in a human trafficking ring. One person helping another to cover up. A lot of BS. Um, anyway, police detective um, expressed they, the... Detectives expressed doubt about the authenticity of this version um, of events. And um, 
Media, it, it said that the police said that media reports about similar sightings have caused an influx of non-credible tips. Why would people do that? Because Melanie wasn't, um, she wasn't, was it the color of her skin, really? Or was it a, a human trafficking ring vying to cover up the tracks? What was it, guys? And so even the police say they're not credible. One is so different from the other. Anyway, um, so um, people also allege they saw an abduction take place on the bridge. Okay, well, I would kind of believe that. The only thing is, it, the wrong time, maybe, the wrong, the wrong um, date, maybe, people were not credible in their um, accounts. And that is what caused police to disregard them. So, guys, and I'm telling you, I do this. Um, anytime that you see something, even if it looks okay, you know, um, report it as suspicious, even if you could be wrong. But it, you never know, because this province is so inundated with uh, human trafficking and abductions and, and scams that you don't want it to happen all over the place. No matter what you do, you can't make a mistake if you ever report suspicious activity. So I encourage you to keep your eyes peeled and, and start to look around and become aware of your surroundings. So um, those were the two witness accounts. Let's move on to a third sighting. Um, another witness who lived on Rebecca Street, which was just off Pine Avenue and near Docks, which is a famous nightclub, um, in my province, and it's a chain. Um, she took her story to the police again, guys, in 2019. And this witness, known to the public as Denise, I'm sure she's an exotic dancer, um, she disclosed that around 1.45 on September the 29th, 1996, she was doing homework in her room, wow, that was a late owl, and she heard a girl screaming outside, right outside of her house. Although she initially ignored the outburst, why would she? Why would she? Why? It's 1.45 a.m. in the morning. You hear a scream and you think nothing of it? Okay. Um, consider where this is coming from. So um, after, after about five, 45 seconds, she heard more screaming and then became frightening, fright, frightened. Well, um, I don't think it would have taken me that long. So after checking that her front door was indeed locked, who checks their front door at 1.45 a.m.? Um, the witness knocked to her bay window, I guess she turned off lights, and saw three dark silhouettes of people running down the street towards Pine Avenue, but no vehicles or headlights. Um, her husband, who was also home at the time, did not witness the event because he was asleep, and maybe because it never happened. I don't know. Um, that's another, that's really weird. That's really weird. And so, um, in 2020, um, the OPP, um, released publicly certain parts of, um, Melanie's female friends' uh, accounts of that evening. And, um especially the friend who described being spooked by a vehicle after leaving the Pine Avenue residence. So apparently, um, this is two accounts 
one by Melanie's friend, the other by the first, the one of these witnesses that was crossing over the bridge by car. So, and this one by the window, three accounts, all kind of similar, right? And so uh, things were happening that night out, out on the streets. And so um, they, they, um, they let her remain anonymous, but um, they did release those details to the public. And um, she has since moved overseas, but I don't think it's related to this. Unless, of course, I don't know certain things. Maybe she was being stopped because of her closeness to Melanie and because she spoke to police. I don't know. Um, it's unfortunate that we don't have the context of this friend's move overseas. And so what can you do? Um, okay, so this is the last little bit before I sign off. Um, the release of um, a certain podcast about Melanie's case from the creator of um, Someone Knows Something led to another witness, this is witness number four, coming forward. Guys, in 2021, didn't he have anything to, better to do during the lockdown? Um, an anonymous male witness um, who was unknown to investigators before getting in touch um, after he heard that podcast. So, okay, maybe, maybe. Um, the tip led police to um, La Roque Field in North Cobalt, roughly 10 kilometers from Melanie's last known location on the, um, on the bridge. And so um, there, OPP officers and the emergency response team surveyed the site with the assistance of search dogs and drones. I would say they're kind of late, wouldn't you? I know that they didn't know, but they're not going to find anything in 2021. I guarantee you, they're not going to find anything. Um, the heavily forested terrain made looking for evidence extremely difficult, and police say that they would have have to schedule additional days to continue searching the area. And so to this day, it's sort of up in the air. Um, I haven't heard anything more about it. And so um, that concludes all the sightings. And um, I'm sure there were many, many more that are not here because it, they are virtually, probably they were all giving on the wrong dates. You know what I'm saying? Wrong locations. But then again, we don't know what happened to Melanie. Um, I, I think they would have had to have followed up on every lead that they possibly could. but. I, I feel sorry for police who have to become involved in a tedious investigation where people will just see anything and think it's part of the crime, you know, because they don't know exactly what they're looking for. And so people don't know. People aren't used to this. Anyway, guys, um, that will conclude the uh, fourth part of the um disappearance of Melanie Elliot. And so um, I, I think for the next time, we will be speaking on the current status of this particular um, cold case. And so, yes, I have to remember where I left off and make a mark in my notes <laughs> so that um, I remember. And so that will be part five, the current status. And oh, this is a very long case to get through, but I hope that you're enjoying it. I hope that you're finding some of it interesting. And, um, you know, I hope it's teaching you um, how to look out for weird stuff on the road or out in public. You know what I'm saying? And so, guys, you know, I'm sorry about my rant in the car, but, um, you know, I'm not going to take it back. I, I Still, on, on the subject of addressing the hate, 
Um, I noticed, and right away when I noticed, I deleted all my posts. Um, you know, on my community tab, I used to have those shared, what I shared about other channels. I deleted them all because I figured that's where the uh, hacker, the pedophile, um, who has it in with me, was getting in to my channel and the comments and going straight for the channels that I shared. And I feel bad because I love these channels. Um, I feel bad that my comments were deleted after your accounts were hacked. Yes, guys, your accounts were hacked. And I think what I'm going to do is post a list of all the accounts that this guy um, or this couple actually uh, went into and deleted. Uh, also, I'm going to give you a link to my um, building security and their website. And um, no use involving the police because they don't care. Um, so anyway, um, it, it's, you know, I feel bad that I shared all those beautiful vlogs that you created and the criminal came and attacked me and you. Because hackers, you know, they bring down channels. What can I say? They bring down channels. They bring down the morale of content creators. Um, but if anything, it gave me more evidence now. I have an awful lot of evidence now because I um, created a whole list, which I passed on to the detective, of all the time, all the comments. I took snapshots of all of them. And they're not there. They were not there anymore. So now um, there's something more for me to go on to give to this detective. And I hope that he can do something because um, YouTube is not able to do anything. Uh, they are hopeless, helpless. I don't know what. I'm interested. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I, I would certainly imagine that they would be proud to have content creators who give a voice to the lost and the, and the uh, departed. Why are they doing this to me? I, I, I don't understand it. Why are they doing this to you? I don't understand it. It's pure hate. Anyway, guys. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, I have to just move on and, and start another day fresh tomorrow. I hope that you have enjoyed um, listening and watching. And please do not forget to like and subscribe. I will talk to you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.